Hey everyone, Anarch here, and this is another episode of Anarch Responds. And in this video, I'm going to be responding to comments on my video, The State is Counter-Revolutionary, Part 3, which covers the beginning of the revolutionary history of Maoist China. So this is the continuation of a few parts in this series where I cover comments on this specific video series called The State is Counter-Revolutionary. And this video series was meant to be, um, first of all, a sort of like theoretical inspection of the state and what it is. And then it was supposed to look at a few examples to sort of uh, solidify these, these uh, theoretical descriptions. And uh, this, this, you know, part three is one that received a lot of praise. In fact, I got to say parts two and parts three were the ones that people mostly paid attention to. Um, but yeah, so this video didn't have a huge amount of critical comments. In fact, I think really there were more critical comments on part two. I think people are more attached to the USSR than they are Maoist China. Uh, that being said, there were a mixture of, of different kinds of comments. So, uh, let's get to discussing those. The first of these is from a user that looks like it's a 26 YD one. I don't know, something like that. Um, it says this series is something of the most primordial I've ever seen on YouTube. Thanks for the detailed knowledge of how things went beside theory to contextualize how and why it failed to show how anarchist theory and scientific consensus and concepts linked to power do effectively predict all this not easy and joyful to hear, but really important. So, um, I think, uh, this, this kind of, that last part, especially not easy and joyful to hear, but really important. That is definitely the main content of the sorts of comments that were on this video. Uh, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think one of the things that made this video so good is actually the music. I think the music in this video was quite beautiful and it was a change of pace from the kind of music that I usually use in my videos, which tends to be like Western classical music. But here I kind of used a bunch of, uh, reprisals of traditional, uh, that use like traditional Chinese instruments. And I think that really added something to this video, made it, made, made it quite beautiful. Um, the other thing I would like to note here, and the reason why I included this, is uh, to show how anarchist theory and scientific consensus and concepts linked to power effectively predict all this. Yeah, I think that's that's really what the goal of, of this whole series, and to some degree, really, my whole channel, is to talk about how um, anarchist power analysis is actually robustly predictive. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of shocking the degree to which the anarchists predict the outcomes of a bunch of different political projects, and they are just deeply vindicated by those projects. Um, it, it, it like in part one of this series, there is a quote by Bakunin where he pretty much describes what the USSR became. And he describes it in, in words where you would, if you heard this quote, you might think it was being described afterwards by somebody, but it was decades before the USSR ever came into existence. So anarchist political uh, analysis is actually very, very rigorous in that sense. It is very good at making predictions. It can tell you Oh, with with very high accuracy, precisely how those projects are going to turn out. So I'm glad that that it was your takeaway from this video. This one is from Isaac, who I think I recognize. Uh, you know, I've seen him from a bunch of other places, but he says help. I keep trying to create a system run by the workers, but the workers keep getting pissed and having strikes because my system doesn't actually give them democratic control over their workplaces. Yeah, it's a pretty good summary of the video. Uh, he says, whenever people collectively decide to do something different than what the state wants, it seems like the state keeps seeking power over democracy. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of a, uh, you know, consistent uh, factor here, isn't it? Yeah. 
um, I mean, that's that's really one of the the commonalities in both of these inspections of the USSR in China is that they like empowered the workers and that, you know, it was a worker revolution. And then they just are upset as soon as the empowered workers actually want to like, uh, you know, use their power and, and that they're not just OK with being dominated. You know, that you have a revolution full of people who wanted to overthrow the previous state of things. And then they they get a uh, you know a new paradigm of existence, and the leaders are all shocked and appalled that these these revolutionary fighters are unhappy with returning to another wage labor system where their labor is commodity you know uh, commodified and and is uh, uh, you know utilized for for the production of profit and so on. Uh, th this is consistent in both of these examples. Uh, although I have to say, uh, uh, perhaps to the credit of of the Chinese revolutionaries that I think they fought even quite a bit harder than the Russian revolutionaries did after they saw what had taken place. This is not, of course, to um, downplay the successes or the, um, you know, uh, revolutionary radicalism of, of the Kronstadt wave and everything. But the, the Chinese workers were not content with being suppressed. And you can kind of see that in part three of this. Uh, this one is from Valerie Thistlewind. It says, great video. I think this one made me more melancholy than the other two, since it seemed so tantalizingly close to achieving what it set out to. Nonetheless, the state does as it is designed to do, obstruct, obstruct revolution for the betterment of the peasant to secure the positions of power for the bureaucrat. Yeah, I mean, that is pretty much, you know, that's a that's a summary of, of what's shown here. You know, uh, you know, obviously the inclusion of this word peasant might be a little specific uh, because it doesn't really seem to matter whether you are a peasant or a, an urban worker or whatever, uh, whatever it is that you are. If you are not in that bureau, that position of bureaucratic control, the bureaucrats will end up having far more power over how society is decided. And um they end up just essentially jumping into the driver's seat and stealing the revolution away from the people who actually made it. So, yeah, no, I, I also found, you know, I talked about in the last response video when I was responding to part two of the state is counter revolutionary that, uh, uh, you know, these videos were sort of emotionally taxing on me and, uh, you know, part two is definitely very emotionally taxing, but part three is definitely the one that was most emotionally taxing, especially when I had to start reading about like the five pests campaign and um, just the the sort of the mass starvation that was taking place. You know, if I'd kept reading or if I'd kept um, writing about the USSR, of course, I would have stumbled across those very same things as the USSR also underwent a massive famine. Uh, but I stopped uh, in the narrative of the part Part two, because by that point, revolution was already dead. There was there was nothing left of the revolution by that point. Um, and whereas in China, it like really stuck around for a while, this sort of revolutionary potential, these, these sorts of like experimental projects where, uh, you know, workers were, were temporarily given power once again, um, take, you know, the, the communes and the urban centers or, or the, uh, um, the great leap out in the, in the, uh, agrarian, uh, sectors of the economy, you know, these, these all represented what appeared to be like promising possibilities. Um, but they were all dashed upon the rocks of the state. The state was a force of, of overt sabotage to all of those attempts. So I had to read through the more, you know, read and write through the more extensive uh, failures of the state and the, the, the famine, which, you know, yes, it was partially cyclic, but it was made quite a bit worse by the by um, intervention of state policy. Next, we have Lucifer Katsu Temp Channel. Apparently a temp channel. Uh, unrelated, but do you happen to have a video on how we could retain welfare or some sort of system that can provide for those that can't work under an anarchist world? Um, you know, it's interesting. I assume this person probably just left this here because this is like a video that was recommended to them and they watched it and they were like got to thinking about anarchism and all that. 
but I'll say right off the bat that this idea that anarchism would mean a society of complete like structurelessness and where there would be like no safety nets for anyone, sort of the misunderstanding of anarchism, right? Uh, in fact, anarchist society would probably have robust safety nets. I mean, you know, people get to come together and make decisions themselves about what kind of society that they would like to have. And it is very, very unlikely that they are going to choose to make a society wherein the weak and the vulnerable just fall through the cracks and are left uh, without any sort of uh, assurance of their, their, their life and well-being. Uh, you know, there, the anarchist society is just a society wherein uh, all decisions are made from the bottom up, uh, wherein we safeguard freedom, equality, and solidarity, um, as well as the uniqueness of every individual and their ability to control the world. So there is no reason to believe that the people, when given power over the world around them, would choose a system which deprives them. You know, anarchism does not mean, once again, does not mean structurelessness. So, you know, how would we provide a welfare system? We would just simply agree to create a welfare system. Um, obviously, I think that, you know, trying to make these exact parallels of uh, uh, the, the modern society's welfare system and what an anarchist society might do is probably not a good way to approach the, the thought experiment. But if all you mean is like assurances for the elderly and the sick and the young that they will not fall through the cracks and that the system will have their backs, then yes, um, anarchism just absolutely would have those sorts of systems. Uh, I do believe that in the response comment here, I basically just instruct this person to go watch like after the revolution. Um, and it's not because after the revolution like directly answers the question. It's just because at least after the revolution might kind of inform them about some of the things I just which is to say that it gives them some understanding of like uh, how anarchism could actually be structured and so it might help to answer their question uh, without perhaps any direct overt references to welfare or anything like that um, this one is from Uncle Obscure Nobody and uh, and uh, this is another one of those errata, and, and I really want to always include these in these response videos because it's a good opportunity for me to make corrections on those videos. This one says, Anarch, you got to correct this error. Mao Zedong never went to France at all. Many Chinese students did, and famously Mao accompanied a group of his fellow students to Shanghai for their departure to study in France, but he himself never left China at all. This is absolutely true. This is just an uh, a, a complete mistake on my part in the script. Uh, in the script, I do indeed say Mao Zedong like visited as a student to France. It's absolutely not correct. That came from me misreading a source. So um, I think that's precisely what I respond here is that I made a mistake and I, I found exactly where I'd made that mistake in reading my source. And uh, yeah, it's true. Mao Zedong did not actually go to France, but Mao Zedong ended up being very influenced by the um, uh, uh, students who became uh, like French exchange students uh, who were from China, who came back and talked to Mao Zedong. And uh, just more context, the part of the video where I mentioned this is a part of the video where I'm basically talking about how um, the sort of like libertarian socialist uh, uh, inklings within Maoism, they most likely arose from the fact that in these in this uh, situation here where Mao Zedong was a sort of, you know, being educated on some of the foundations of political theory by those people who came back from France, that. Uh, uh, anarchism was introduced to him, and he was actually very pro-anarchist uh, well before he ever became a statist. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm glad that this person made this correction, and there's, in fact, another person in the comments who makes this exact correction. I appreciate when people uh, go through and kind of find these, these um, particular points. Uh, Idaman412 says this is the most underrated channel on YouTube. If you think so, I appreciate it. Uh, why is this included here? Just as a plug, if you think that I'm the most underrated channel on YouTube, you should like this video and uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, you know, go comment down below. It helps with the algorithm. 
Also, I'd like to note, if you're trying to help this channel not be an underrated channel, the big, the big thing that makes a big difference in the success of a channel is how often do you click the thumbnails when they pop up and how long do you watch the video after you click through? So this is sort of how they judge, like how engaged are people in the channel is like when the, when the thumbnail pops up in the options, do they click it? And when they click it, do they actually stay engaged? And this appears to be the most important sorting factor for videos getting ranked on YouTube. So if you're trying to help the channel, if you want it to not be the quote unquote, the most underrated channel on YouTube, that is how you can help. <laughs> Comrade Freedom says, Caleb Maupin needs to see this video. Now, why did I include this? Because hilariously, there's like three comments that, <laughs> that mentioned Caleb Maupin. And I'm not sure why that Caleb Maupin get, gets mentioned so much on part three of this series. Uh, but yeah, numerous people mentioned Caleb Maupin uh, in the comments to this video. So if you're not familiar, Caleb Maupin is an authoritarian leftist, really kind of the worst of the authoritarian left. Um, you know, and uh, he's involved with a group which is called uh, CPI. Uh, and he has very recently been involved in a bunch of uh, allegations of abuse and, um, you know, abuse of his powers uh, as, a, as an authority figure um, and uh, appears to have been kind of manipulating people within his circle uh, in order to separate them from their families, in order to kind of turn them against one another. A lot of cult tactics seem to be happening. So Caleb Maupin is sort of a villain for a lot of people, um, both anarchists and a lot of authoritarian leftists even see him as kind of a villainous character. He's also kind of associated with this idea that if you want communism to appeal to people, you should make it really conservative. Um, so he said also a bunch of kind of really like anti-Semitic stuff well before he was ever in the public eye and being scrutinized. He wrote an entire book, uh, which I think was called Satan at the Fountain head, which was essentially just a screed again, uh, an anti-Semitic screed, um, which he has now removed, which I don't know if I should take that as him actually disavowing it, or he just doesn't want to be recognized as, as an anti-Semite. But anyway, really bad guy. So uh, there were a lot of comments about Caleb Maupin in the comments to uh, uh, part three of this video. So uh, Tormen VII says... A centralized military seems necessary, in my opinion, in order to defeat enemy nations' militaries. The trick is how to avoid that original military hierarchy from infecting everything else. I don't think anarchists have a good answer yet to this problem. I sincerely, sincerely hope we do find one, though, because without it, Maoism is what you will get. Uh, it, well, there's, there's kind of several presuppositions within this. The first is that you're saying a centralized military is necessary. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I'll go, I'll go one by one here because, you know, there's like several claims within this. A centralized military definitely has its advantages. And uh, one is that when you have a central node, that central node can kind of convey consistent information between all of the other parts of the system. So it's good if you have a small number of strategists for those strategists to sort of be at the at the the center of the the of all the decision making so that they can uh, maintain strategic consistency over all of the different nodes. However, it's not strictly necessary to have a centralized hierarchical military in order to succeed. In fact, in the modern era, what we found, you know, a fourth and fifth generation uh, warfare seems to be kind of predicated on decentralization, seems to be predicated on, um, you know, this power, uh, uh, this military power sort of arising from a bunch of small guerrilla militia bodies. And in fact, this sort of decentral military form is, is uh, from what we can see, high highly effective against central militaries. Um, you know, obviously I can point to, uh, uh, 
you've got uh, like ISIS and you've got like Al Qaeda, which I know I'm not trying to pretend that they're like fully decentral, but damn, they use a lot of cell tactics. You got to You got to uh, note that fact. There was, uh, there's also just a lot of decentral guerrilla tactics taking place in a lot of the places that are resist, resisting the United States and which have succeeded in resisting the United States. In fact, th this decentralization seems to be a really important component. So it should just be noted that we've kind of moved past the age of warfare, wherein you have to have a, a centralized military hierarchy in order to succeed. Um, you know, another example might be, for example, Rojava, where yes, they do, they do indeed have a sort of uh, a central apparatus, but they're also a confederation of militias. And those militias make decisions on the ground for themselves within the scope of strategic imperatives that have been made. So yeah, it's not like it's really not just as simple as saying you have to have a centralized hierarchical structure even though it might be true that you do want um, at least one, you do need a component within your your army or your your you know fed, confederation of militias, which can uh, coordinate between all of your different militia structures. Uh, that part in, at least appears to be correct. Uh, and then, of course, you know the trick is how to avoid the original military hierarchy from infecting everything else. Um, on that part the military hierarchy infecting everything else. I just want to note that we have a really good example in the EZLN, which is to say the Zapatistas. So what happened with the Zapatistas? And um, I love kind of talking about this because I find it to be such an interesting story. The EZLN was actually a... Um, uh, what you might call like a vanguard group, an authoritarian left vanguard group with with heavy influences from a bunch of different things, including uh, a Zapatismo, which was actually anarchist. So, you know, it was, it was very it was very synthetic. It had a lot of influences, but it was essentially a military guerrilla group, you know, uh, or, or you might call it a a militant formation that rested within the city, the city um, uh, center. And what happened is a certain point, they just got, they got chased out of the cities and they ended up going out to the countrysides. When they go out to the countrysides, they can, they actually, um, I don't want to say for the first time, but really kind of for the first time confront the indigenous people that they had been, um, basing their rhetoric around being the defenders of, they were the defense of, of the indigenous sovereignty, uh, there in Mexico. However, this was the first time they really encountered those indigenous people, specifically in Chiapas. And when they went to these people, they said, you know, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to fight a war or are we not? And the indigenous people, interestingly said, yes. You're right that we have to fight a war, but you're wrong that we need you to govern us. And the deal that the indigenous people of Chiapas made with the EZLN is that the EZLN would be subverted to the councils. The councils would determine and dictate all of the mandates and the direction of the EZLN, of this sort of like militant vanguard. And so in this way, what you can see is this concept of, of you know, under uh, horizontal structures, what you have is that, you know, when there is power that is is uh, uh, concentrated, it is always subverted to the bottom level. The bottom level always controls or always has the de facto power in society. It always has the default level of control. If anything is 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 to be you know withdrawn, the bottom bottom level can always um, recover whatever power it is that they've given to in into some structure that they've imbued into some structure. So what they did is they essentially. Uh, turned the EZLN into a delegate military. <laughs> they essentially delegated the EZLN to be their military, and they established what you might call a sort of horizontal hegemony over that military or a, or a horizontal supremacy over the military, such that the military served the councils, not vice versa. It's a very important fact that I would like to note. Take the USSR as, an, as a counterexample. The councils all subverted their own uh, decision-making power to the military apparatus. And this is really where the failure, place, the failure took, point, uh, took place. 
So um, there are alternatives, even if you do choose something that kind of has a more traditional uh, central or hierarchical military structure. Um, so I don't think they, they can go on to say, I don't think anarchists have a good answer yet to this problem. It, you know, I think that's kind of up in the air. I think that's undetermined. I actually think that some of the answers I just gave you there are a pretty good answer, but also in my video constructing the revolution, I sort of give more answers to this question, not only how you might, you know, structure, a, you know, militias, but how you would even structure like spy networks and stuff. Uh, so if it interests you, if that sort of question interests you, I recommend constructing the revolution. And there's even some mention of this as well in after the revolution. Um, they then go on to say, I sincerely hope we do find one though, because without it, Maoism is what you will get. And I think this is the reason why I was a little confused by this comment. I'm not sure what they mean by Maoism is what you will get. I think maybe they're kind of being gestural. They're saying, you know, you'll get an authoritarian structure. I'm not sure that you'll get specifically Maoism, but, uh, but yeah, good comment. I understand what they're saying. I disagree with them, but I get where they're coming from. So here we have another comment by our old friend RFVGBZHN. If you've been watching the previous ones here, this person has commented numerous times on these videos. Um, they really went through and made an extensive series of comments. And, I, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, I disagree with them pretty much everything they say, but I appreciate that they really took the time to engage with the material. So... Um, they're basically referring here to the fact that what I say is that uh, uh, Marxism generally says that the peasant class is not a revolutionary class. Um, the peasant class is not the site for radicalization, the proletarian, which is to say specifically the, the you know, urban wage laborers, which, which you know, act under this, this sort of uh, heavily industrialized capitalism. That's where Marx and most Marxists conceive that the most revolutionary potential takes place. Um, you know, within this video, what I'm talking about is why we have, we kind of, you know, Marxism uh, moved away from that, which is to say Mao had a huge influence on the movement away from that because there was such a significant, you know, uh, uh, peasant uh, um, force within the Maoist revolution, but that traditionally it wouldn't, the peasant peasantry wouldn't have been seen as your site for revolutionary activity. They would have been seen as some, you know, uh, a group of people who was not functioning under the new paradigm of oppression and exploitation. The idea is, you know, you have some oppressed people. Those oppressed people function under a certain economic system. That economic system brings them to misery and it alienates them from their own power in certain ways. And therefore, you're going to develop a consciousness that is anti the system that brings you misery when you are under a particular system. And so you develop an, uh, a consciousness against that particular system when you are affected by it. Whereas the peasantry, you know, in this old conception, wasn't yet functioning in response to capitalism, it was functioning kind of old, under these old dictates and, and uh, mechanisms for functioning. Um, I kind of disagree with this. I think that really the peasantry in almost every single country had already been dealing with the, the dictates of capitalism out in the countryside. It was just really Really not in the same way as the urban proletariat, but that is another topic. Um, but they can, they contend that's not the case. Already before Marx and Engels, there were many peasant revolts, which I didn't dispute, that were either be that were either crushed or led to a resurrection of the old system under a new leader, which often happened, for instance, in China. Okay, I don't know if that's really relevant to what I'm discussing here. Orthodox Marxists say just say that the peasants won't be able to play a role on their own. Eh, yeah, I mean, I guess I could see that. Um, but they would follow either the proletariat or the petty bourgeoisie. And before proletariat and bourgeoisie existed, they followed feudalist leaders, which just led to change of feudalist power, as it was often the case in pre-modern China. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand what you're saying here. Um 
they, you know, they didn't th- they didn't think of the peasantry as having being a revolutionary class that was going to lead the way. They tended to to kind of you know follow the lead of of other sorts of revolutionary contingencies. Um, and uh, you know, I can see what you're saying about how they would either follow the, follow the proletariat, in which case they would have a sort of a socialist or communist revolutionary consciousness, or the petty bourgeoisie, in case that we see, for example, in fascism in a lot of places. Um, and then, you know, they're mentioning that they often followed feudal leaders. Um, and that's absolutely true. You know, you see that a lot within history that uh, the peasantry will be riled by uh, one or another sort of feudal leader. And uh, they will, you know, often have a sort of communistic thrust to what they're trying to do. But they will indeed kind of uh, uh, rally behind some particular leader within the feudal order. Um, but I think that this you're still missing the point. Uh, the point of the matter within the video, within the context of the video, is that when Mao came around, um, Marxists were not looking at the peasantry as having a revolutionary potential. And they were not looking them at them as uh, possibly themselves uh, having a uh, being a revolutionary constituency that might have its own demands and might itself be a force for anti-capitalism. And uh, I don't think that, that that really is refuted by this comment. Uh, But, uh, you know, we could see it in good faith as just being clarification. According of what Trotskyists say today, yes, of course, as I noted last time, this clearly, they're clearly a Trotskyist. In China, they ultimately followed the Soviet Union, which also led to the similarities that pre-Dengis China had to the Soviet Union. No, I don't really agree with this characterization. I think that this... Once again, as kind of I mentioned in a previous comment, this sort of like just assumes the um, the incapability of the peasantry to have a revolutionary consciousness or their own sort of um, uh, radical or militant nature to them. You know, that's that's really my what I think your mistake was when you analyze Russia. And I mentioned that last time in, in the second part of this this response here. Uh, no, the Russian peasantry, in fact, did have a lot of potential, revolutionary potential. And in fact, I think had really a, a more directly communist sort of orientation than even the urban proletariat did. Uh, And I think you also made the same mistake here in seeing the Chinese peasantry as themselves, you know, following Mao, which is to say, quote unquote, following the proletarian leaders. And that that is what was really happening. No, they had they had their grievances beforehand. They wanted a different world beforehand. It didn't take Mao or the urban proletariat coming to them and educating them from the outside. Um, They definitely already had a very radical consciousness. And I think this is something you'll find in a lot of different examples is that people that are in these peasant conditions are often very radical. Um, and, and in fact, their, their connection to the land, uh, and then their, the, and often their connection to old indigenous traditions, uh, you know, traditions that are indigenous to their land, make them even more revolutionary, more communist in many occasions. And it doesn't, it's not that they need quote unquote, some leader from the proletariat to lead them. Uh, that, that's not the case at all. They really just need to be, you know, given like uh, form and structure. And that's absolutely true of any people with revolutionary potential. The urban proletariat didn't themselves go and just develop all of these, you know, uh, 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 structures of revolutionary power uh, uh, just ipso facto out of nowhere spontaneously. And I know there's all these theoretical disputes around the word spontaneous, but there had to be given structure, organizational structure and body to those struggles as well in the urban centers. It, it, it in many ways, it follows the same arc of events, which is to say you need to give uh, organizational structure in order for uh, uh, militant revolutionary activity to take place, whether that's the peasantry or people with urban centers. Um, the only difference is, is we have been very chauvinistic about our focus on urban centers in the history of leftist theory, which has led us to neglect the potential of people within rural areas. Uh, yeah, this is the person I believe that I responded to the last two times that I kind of made a joke of their responses. Um, I think this one is the most reasonable of any of the ones that we've seen so far, but I thought it's a Gannett, Gannett Joker. They say, very good video. And wow, okay, just right off the bat, you say something nice. That's different. 
Um, if I'm being honest, I'm not really informed in the Chinese experiment. And as Mao said, no investigation. Um, I think it's, it goes on to be like, you know, no investigation, no right to speak, if I recall correctly. Uh, generally, after having watched the previous videos, as well as, as well, this is better in terms of research and citations, always in comparison. Uh, okay, I don't think that's necessarily correct. I think it's about the same amount. You've probably just been propagandized a lot more about the USSR. Um, the animosity is still here, and the double standards are getting more and more obvious. I, I really, I wish they would have given, you know, been specific about that because I don't, I don't, you know, there's no animosity. I'm, I'm, I'm sad about what happened in these examples. I, you know, I'm not looking to, to, um, you know, defame the 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 people in struggle. In fact, I'm I I hope to be very sympathetic to the workers and the peasantry and all of that in 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 all of these videos, because I, in fact, am very sympathetic. Uh, but I think it's obvious that what they really mean is just that they don't like that I'm critical of the state and the state bureaucrats and their role in the failure of these projects. Um, as always, no materialist analysis. Uh, that means nothing, as, as with their previous mention. They, there's, there's no meaning to what they mean by materialist analysis. Um, they just mean there's no analysis that agrees with my conceptions. Um, there's no analysis that is within line of my, my, my you know, uh, beliefs. Uh, and they call that materialist analysis, which really has no relation to materialism. But of course, that is to be expected. I don't have specific notes since I'm not the most read up socialist on China. In conclusion, this video gets an 8 out of 10 with the anarchist standard on. Uh, okay, the least smarmy of any of their responses. So, you know, we'll call that a redemption arc, I guess. Uh, Corsican Rose says, I'm confused why you need to prove that the state is counter-revolutionary when that statement is about as much of a truism as saying that a bachelor is an unmarried man. Yeah, I think I respond to something like, tell that to the authoritarian leftists, and numerous other people are like, if only tankies knew that, and so on. Um, yeah, but I, I want to make kind of a distinction here, because I understand what they're saying. They're saying, yeah, the state's role is to prevent revolutionary activity. You know, it's supposed to suppress revolutionary activity. Um, and I could see how someone would kind of like take away from the title that that's what I'm saying, and that like, that's like a trivial fact. But I would like to emphasize that's actually not quite what I'm getting at with that title. What I'm getting at is that the state is a um, a mechanism of sabotage when revolutions do take place. That when revolutions do take place, when they use a state, they sabotage themselves and they destroy their revolutionary potential in the process. So what I'm saying is the state is counter-revolutionary in that sense. Not that the state... Um, is meant to suppress new revolutions, but that it actually even, in fact, suppresses revolutions that brought it into power. So that's that's what I'm really getting at with the title of this series. Uh, Brandon Johnson says, I watch this video once a week. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the y'all y'all take take Brandon's example to heart, you know, watch all my videos once a week. Uh, you know, that's that's uh, that's what you can do for the channel. It's not a big deal. Just watch every single one of my videos, all of them once a week. And that's it. That's all you got to do. Follow in Brandon Johnson's footsteps. Um, Anarcho Perp says, why on earth were Stalin and Mao so visibly uncomfortable around each other at 1322? Did someone make a rude comment? So I think they were kind of making a joke here, but I remember I kind of respond something along the lines of, there's probably a good reason why they were uncomfortable around each other. Uh, we have this conception that the USSR just like backed China unquestioningly. And it's absolutely true that like Soviet technicians and experts of various kinds did indeed help uh, China develop. They came to China and they told them how they might try to manage their economy and help them run industry, for example, uh, a bunch of other examples, but that's just one. 
Uh, so, you know, a lot of us have this conception that because they were part of, you know, this big block of, of, you know, what were called the quote unquote communist powers during that period of time, that that meant that the USSR and China like got along, but that's actually not true. In fact, there were like significant border disputes between China and the Soviet Union, which uh, at times almost escalated into, into uh, all out conflict. And they, they did kind of escalate into into conflict at certain points. These never got like wildly out of control. This is the reason why we didn't have like a war. But there is there's actually you can go look it up, just Google like Sino Soviet conflict, and you'll find that there are there are several articles where things got pretty hot. Like they they were they did not get along a hundred percent and there was at certain points like some skepticism of the involvement of the USSR in the affairs of China and in their development so they had uh, more of an uneasy peace than probably a lot of people think they did uh, you know uh, Mao may have very well felt some <laughs> some uh, you know feelings of discomfort being around Stalin so uh, Stekra says Australia and China are so far the only countries that have declared war on birds. Both lost. <laughs> I love I love this comment. Yeah, this is this is the takeaway of the video. Uh, don't declare war on birds. Uh, so the context of this for those I suppose that haven't watched it is that in. In Mao's China, they carried out what was called the five pests campaign. And uh, one of those pests were sparrows. You know, they didn't have any conception of ecology. They had this very kind of reductive mindset of how things were supposed to be handled. And they thought the state could just domineer nature. And uh, they thought that, you know, a bunch of species were quote unquote pests, which were not pests. They were part of a big complementary ecosystem. And uh, one of them, the, probably the worst, the worst of these pests that they chose was the sparrow. The sparrow, in fact, feasted on locusts. And uh, I'm sure as soon as I say that, you can see what went wrong, right? They, 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 people hunted sparrows almost completely out of existence. What that meant was the locust populations boomed wildly out of control. And that meant that the locusts consumed uh, a large number of Chinese crops. They already experienced like cyclic drought seasons. And this essentially led to wide scale disaster. Um, the locust populations that particular uh, year when the when the sparrows were almost, you know, were hunted to exhaustion was a huge contributor to the to the famine in China, which was one of the worst famines in human history. In fact, when I was reading about it, there were some sources which claimed it was literally the worst famine in human history. Um, so part of the reason why this event was included in the video was precisely because I was trying to show how state intervention in the ecology is foolhardy. It is um, hubristic. It is arrogant to believe that the, that the state knows how to intervene in the ecology and to reform and reshape the ecology better than the ecology does. It is the height of state arrogance, and it killed a large amount of people, hundreds of thousands, millions, if I recall correctly. Human EV says, why did China become revisionist according to MLMs? What reasoning do they give? Um, so, you know, I've kind of like argued with a few Maoists on the internet. And so I've seen at least a few responses to this question, but they tend to blame uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping and the series of, of leaders that came right after Mao. Uh, they don't tend to like blame Mao or the party bureaucrats uh, that existed during Mao's time. Uh, they tend to basically say that, you know, these these leaders that came right afterwards uh, took China down what they call the quote unquote capitalist road. And though I will agree, obviously, that Deng Xiaoping, um, I don't know how many people are really familiar with Deng Xiaoping that are listening to this. Um, he was indeed a, a, an implemental figure in turning China into a more traditionally capitalist uh, state. And I would say in a very real way led to the, you know, sort of, rev uh, you know, 
movement of China into modern day, just capitalist China, not even state capitalist, but just capitalist China. I think Deng definitely has a lot of responsibility for that. But if I recall correctly, in the comments, somebody kind of says precisely what I'm saying and they respond, yeah, but how do they, how do they like square the fact that they, that this was allowed to happen? that this was able to happen? You know, how do they excuse the fact that that was able to happen? And nobody was able to provide them a response. And that's because there isn't a response. That is the gaping hole at the center of the authoritarian mentality, is they have not recognized that when they create these centralized, hierarchical, authoritarian structures, that the, that, that, that leader at the top, that that centralized power at the top, you know, they're always talking about, oh, it's not just the, the, the central leader. It's, you know, a, a, a cabinet of eight people or whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay, compare eight people to the number of people in the nation. When you create that amount of concentration of power, when those people either become corrupted or replaced by somebody who doesn't have the, the same vision, what you get is a failure point. It turns that into a failure point. This is why complex systems analysis is so important. Complex systems analysis destroys the concept of centralization because there are what are called black swan events. Every system will experience what are called black swan events, and they are unexpected catastrophic events. Okay? And the system has to be built with the recognition there will always be unexpected catastrophic events. So you have to build a system that is able to weather unexpected catastrophic events. However, authoritarian systems are highly rigid. So what they have to do is they have to rely on the, you know, particular ideological and intellectual composition of some leader or very small group of leaders, the very top. And when the time comes when those leaders are replaced or they lose their way and so on and so on, they are going to be replaced by other people who are probably not going to have, you know, your high standard of ideological, ideological and intellectual development. Like that's just, you know. And most of the time, they're also not going to be the people that carried out the revolution themselves. And the longer you go from the revolution, the less likely they are to have been involved in this this revolutionary, this militant action that got them to that point. And so in this way, and you're just looking at it from purely from a systems uh, perspective, centralization is extremely susceptible to black swan events. And this is um, part of the reason why I think that anarchism has stood the test of time so well and is so good at predicting the failures of these systems because the anarchists recognize that simple fact, whereas the authoritarians sort of like live in denial of that fact. And they're constantly asking themselves, you know, oh my God, how can we establish this sort of like ideological consistency of the leaders such that quote unquote revisionism doesn't take place? You can't. Moreover, even if you did, they would be corrupted by the position. So, yeah, this question is good because you'll find they just don't have an answer to this question. This is the central question, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and here we go. You know, this one, I screenshotted numerous of these. This is a back and forth. So... This one I screenshotted because it's a sort of cautionary tale, okay? Uh, This person comes in at powers of darkness, and they say, stateless revolutions don't exist, though. Somebody responds just, Zapatistas. And they say, they have a state. They are not stateless. That is false. Zapatistas do not have a state. Um, as we just described a minute ago, what they have is a confeder- they have confederations of council structures which make all decisions in society. And that is precisely the absence of a state. In fact, if they had really been paying attention to this video series closely, they would already recognize that that is not how the anarchists define the state. Um, you know, the state is not just having any sort of structure and consistency, the ability to defend oneself, the ability to form militias. Um, that is not what a state is. Uh, the state takes on tax tasks that, that we might recognize, such as, you know, administration, um, uh, regulation, uh, uh, you know, militias or, or mil- army structures and intelligence, but those are not what define a state. What defines the state is a great deal of centralization and bureaucratization. 
so they're wrong. And this person said, this person kind of continues going. The Spanish Revolution, the Mocknovian Revolution, the Korean Anarchist Revolution, Rojava. And they say, revolutionary Catalonia had a state, prisons, police, conscription, a few planned economic policies. I mean, right off the bat, they're wrong. It did not have a state. Um, prisons, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that's true to some degree. They definitely had a way to detain enemy militants. Um, it wasn't like the same as the prisons we have. Uh, even those enemy militants were treated much better. But, but yes, um, I would agree that they had prisons. They police, not really, not in the sense that we discuss. Uh, and once again, this is a confusion of a necessary function for the same function as the state carries it out. Of course, they had people who were like, you know, militias, essentially, that would defend people from, you know, abusers and exploiters and so on in domestic society. But they did not have a police force in the sense that, you know, bourgeois society has one. Uh, conscription, that I'm not certain about, but that doesn't really square with things that I've heard, which is that sometimes they had issues um, getting people at the fronts because they didn't conscript people. And um, yeah, uh, that one I'm not going to weigh in on. Uh, but conscription is something, you know, we might be able to justify given the fact that we're in the middle of an active conflict. And then a few planned economic policies. Planned economic policies have nothing to do with specifically being the state. In fact, an anarchist society is bound to be based around a bunch of planned economic policies. Planning is not the opposite of the, uh, of anarchism, and planning is not requisite of the state. So that's just, you know, kind of shows they have a mistaken understanding of what the state is. They confuse some of the functions, the necessary functions the state carries out, um, as being indicative or of being definitional of the state when these are not the things that define the state. They say Machno had two secret police agencies, conscription, a handful of planned economic, there's repeating their mistakes. Um, a secret police, once again, it was intelligence. These weren't domestic police forces. Conscription, uh, but once again, no, that's not my impression. I think they also had issues with, with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, getting people to the fronts. And then again, they think plan having economic policies or planning is, uh, is against horizontal power. That's completely false. You can definitely have all kinds of economic policies. And, uh, in fact, decentral planning was the primary mechanism anarchists always proposed as being how the, econ uh, the economy functioned in anarchist society. Uh, gulags, they did not have like gulags in the sense that the USSR had them. They did not have like, you know, brutal labor camps. That is absolutely false. That is just false. Um, and, but I think, you know, what we're getting here is, and this is why I said it's a cautionary tale. This person clearly was just like propagandized by authoritarians. Right. They had a discussion with authoritarians and authoritarians just like regurgitated a bunch of made up bull crap that they that they had read a bunch, you know, all the lies made up by Bolsheviks. They basically just delivered a bunch of like, um, uh, uh, you know, pre-rehearsed rhetoric and propaganda that had been developed. And it sounds like they bought it. And they said that he was literally just a bandit who raided towns regularly to fund this whole thing. That is just a blatant lie. <laughs> That's just made up. That is not true at all. Uh, Machno, in fact, came to towns. And when there were huge banks of money, they would actually just take the money and tell people to hand it out. There you go. That's your money. Mint your own money. In fact, that was kind of one of the problems is that um, uh, in in the free territories, they kind of had issues with um, uh, uh, monetary solvency because they didn't really have a consistent monetary system. So it's actually the opposite. They didn't go around like raiding and pillaging towns. They went into towns and they liberated them and honestly gave them very little direction. That's actually one of my criticisms of what took place in the free territories and is a criticism Machno himself said about what they had done in the free territory. So this person's just been literally lied to misinformed about what took place. Um, they say, then they could just go, I'm not read up on the anarch Korean anarchist revolution. 
Rojava has a state, a parliament, prisons. I don't think they have planned economic policies. It's really weird because Rojava would have been the best place for them to have lobbied their criticisms because Rojava has more of a state structure than any of the other examples, yet they falsely think they don't have planned economic policies, which is very weird. Um, they do kind of have a parliament, but also they have a mass number of bottom up council organizations that let that rest at the level of the community. So Rojava is kind of a weird mixture insofar as that we would have a discussion about how it was structured and whether it was a good example for this person to bring up. It's kind of like a mixed affair in some ways. Yes. And in some ways, no, uh, does it have a state? I, I've been kind of taking to calling it like a mini state or, or a quasi state or something. I, I think it kind of has like an embryonic state it could develop into something like a state structure. Um, prisons. Once again, we're just talking about detaining. We're talking about POWs, we're talking about prisoners of war, right? This is not the same as like bourgeois prison systems. So, and then they say, and also there's the EZLN has a state, don't know about prisons or economic policies, but the state is really the main thing that makes it not anarchist. Once again, this is just false. Um, it absolutely does not have a state in, in, unless you think a state is just planning and, and, uh, and structure, which it's not. Um, the EZLN, uh, the, the only hierarchical structure that exists is completely uh, subverted to all of the horizontal council structures. So this is just absolutely false. This person's clearly just been lied to and propagandized. Um, there's just clearly there was like a, a series of uh, talking points and they were very susceptible to them because they didn't do enough research beforehand. And then, you know, somebody was like, you know, basically like that's not true you know like this th these these there there are examples this person goes i was right there with you a couple of months back but they just aren't anarchist <laughs> machno literally advocated for a vanguard party under a different name but just instead of it being marxist leading it was anarchist thinkers so in other words they don't understand how platformism functions um platformism is uh, basically an anarchist philosophy where what you do is, is, and this is where the similarity, similarity lies. You develop an ideologically consistent, strategically unified group of anarchists, which are meant to spread anarchism to others. And they are meant to create consistency and not to cooperate with authoritarianism. So I can see, and, and I, I think I, I kind of, I disagree, but I understand what they're saying when people compare this to a vanguard. Yeah, I understand. It's got similarities to a vanguard, but the big part that's different from a vanguard is that it is not hierarchical. You know, this structure is not meant to, number one, is not internally hierarchical like a, like a vanguard party, and it is not desiring to take the reins and control the revolution from above like a vanguard party. So this is more... I don't think this person is trying to be deceptive. I think they've been deceived. So they've been deceived by rhetoric and their lack of education about these subjects has made them susceptible to it. Uh, the concept being that those who show up more to meetings and are more active gain more authority to manage things and lead the movement. Um, that is true absolutely in every kind of structure. Uh, there will always, unfortunately, be some kind of hierarchy of participation. Um, there is absolutely no structure that can be built that I've ever heard of that, uh, uh, you know, supervenes that problem other than one that has like, like a mandatory voting or something. This person says, any sources regarding Catalonia? The Republican government was still in place, so you might be talking about that. Uh, Machnovian secret police weren't for Machnovia. They were to spy on the Red Army. Exactly. The conscription was used in limited number of times in critical times, and it wasn't always there. Okay, so maybe they know something I don't. I don't remember hearing about conscription, but regardless, I, I, I don't think personally I would be against conscription in time of military, uh, in time of uh, a military conflict. All right. So 
this person responded, all of these societies were fighting civil or foreign wars for the majority or the entirety of their existences, including against other, quote unquote, socialists, uh, parentheses, Stalinists, in the case of revolutionary Catalonia. This person's kind of pointing out a little of what I was saying there, which is to say these are really not the, the same features. These are features that are just necessary because you're in the middle of a conflict. Um, okay, so let's give them let's give them their response time here. Uh, the Stalinists were the only major nation. Okay, see, this person now is just going full on propaganda mode, and the reason I said this is a cautionary tale is precisely because of this response. Um, that is to say, I just want to emphasize to all of you how important it is to be educated, to like learn about history, to go sort of like critically examine all of the events that you're reading about because if all you have is a kind of like loose and not very well informed not very detailed understanding of things you're probably going to find that you might be very susceptible to deceptive rhetoric and outright propaganda you know authoritarian propaganda um, false retellings of history and so on when somebody confronts you with them this person clearly just doesn't know, didn't know any of the facts of the matter about how these things functioned. And then they got into an, an um, you know, a discussion with somebody who was an authoritarian who misinformed them about a lot of things and didn't really, um, they didn't really have a good foundation by which to defend their ideas and their beliefs. Um, and I think that's one of the big reasons why I made the channel. It's why I made this video series as well, was in order to give people a little bit of that foundation, that basic foundation, so that they wouldn't be susceptible to being deceived in this way. So they would know enough of the facts that they would be able to sort of find the discrepancies between the deceptive rhetoric that authoritarians often use and the reality of the matter. However, Let's go through this response, because I think this response demonstrates how thoroughly kind of brainwashed that they've been here. They say, the Stalinists were the only major nation to aid against Franco, to blame them for the loss of the C&T, which couldn't even manage supply chains. I mean, first of all, it's not like like blaming the scene or blaming uh, Stalinists or blaming Russia is just like, you know, out of the blue, you know, Stalin and the USSR openly sabotaged the anarchists. They agreed. I'll just give you a bunch of examples. They agreed to um, uh, provide arms to the anarchists and they gave them the absolute worst quality arms they could give them. They gave better quality arms to the liberal capitalist government than they gave to the anarchists who were in, who were out and fighting and against uh, the fascists in Spain. They gave them the worst quality, the throwaway, the stuff that didn't even work essentially. That's just one example. Okay. Number two, here's another example. They would go uh, to the councils and they would basically say, uh, we're going to make a deal with you. We'll stop giving you our junk and we'll give you better quality stuff and we'll give you air support. We'll even give you the stuff to do your own air support, airplanes and so on. If all you do is um, uh, you subvert your councils and you give give power instead to Soviet uh, uh, representatives who just have power over the entire council, get rid of socialist, you know, workplace democracy, get rid of the power of the people and instead put in place, you know, Soviet bureaucrats and we'll stop giving you our garbage. And of course, they weren't going to do that. They weren't going to sacrifice the revolution to please a bunch of state capitalists. And so they gave them nothing. They continued giving them garbage, which made it more likely they were going to lose to the fascists. So in that way, they actively aided the fascists because they weren't being given power over the Spanish anarchists. They basically said, destroy your revolution or we'll let the fascists win. So that's example number two. Example number three is that eventually they out and out, because here's the thing, the, uh, Stalin and the USSR had been openly cooperating with the Republican government. In fact, that's where their, their, all of their efforts were going, were, were supporting the liberal government. And they eventually, 
they uh, pushed within parliament to try to decollectivize all of these anarchist regions. The anarchists had been making deals with the Spanish government in order to continue the collectives and to be given the protection of the republic of the state for those collectives for a very long time. And then what happened was, you know, Soviet intervention, they made it to where they, they pushed to get those decollectivized. Once again, they were trying to sabotage the anarchists at every single angle. Okay. And when they, when they finally got that done, they had a Soviet general, General Lister, literally got an army contingent together and went through the countrysides, sacking collectives one after another, dissolving militias, getting into conflicts with the anarchists, threatening to kill them or, or they had to decollectivize. And they, so they disarmed the anarchists, they destroyed the collectives and they, they literally got into like, like uh, conflicts in order to make this happen if the anarchists did not submit to their destruction of the revolution. And in this process, of course, the anarchists didn't want to have a big bloody conflict. But what it led to was that all of those economic centers, all of the countryside, all of the urban areas that the anarchists once had that were producing were highly productive. They were all sabotaged and their productivity went down, which made the whole economy, the whole Spanish economy suffered because the USSR refused to let the anarchists have an autonomous region and fight a revolution. So the idea that this person is trying to say that there's no culpability to the USSR is absolutely mind blowingly absurd. But once again, they've been lied to, I assume. And then they say just a lie. They couldn't manage supply lines, like getting blankets to wounded soldiers who regularly died of cold. I don't know where they got any of this. Um, in fact, everything I've heard is that the supply lines were very solid and that they didn't have any issues getting anything to the front. Um, yeah, undisciplined deserting, deserting at the front. I didn't, I've heard quite the opposite. They had very low desertion rates. In fact, um, the fascists had higher desertion rates. In fact, often the anarchist militias had um, a bunch of uh, defectors, a bunch of fascist defectors, because if things worked so much better on the anarchist side, their supply lines were so well managed. Um, yeah, where, where soldiers would head in alone to die against greater forces. This is just made up like a, Nearly every revolution to ever been won had support from either a portion of or the whole military. The CNT had no military support. Frequently, the poor and exploited are conscripted to have no other choice but to join the army. This creates a revolutionary base with access to means of political power. This, pers this person's just literally saying they should have just destroyed their revolution and they should have tried to persuade the liberal government uh, and... You know, this is literally a counter-revolutionary viewpoint. Like this person is against revolution. And they not only are justifying Stalin destroying the anarchist collectives and destroying, you know, a revolutionary project, but they're also saying that you shouldn't even be revolutionary, that you should just cooperate with the liberal government. Um, so, yeah, they've just been outwardly, openly brainwashed like i mean it's sad i mean they've been clearly very deceived and now they're counter-revolutionary and it's precisely as the video title says um when you support the state you become a counter-revolutionary like there's not much you can do about it because th supporting the state and supporting its methods is a counter-revolutionary measure in and of itself Yeah, uh, stuff you need to engage in a revolution and in warfare. The CNT had no military faction that split off and supported them. They had no military experience, no supply, no discipline. Yeah, they just are making things up. Um, in fact, you know, there was a plenty of the CNT FAI, which was consisting of previous people who were in the military. That's, of course, why they had the military knowledge they had. Um, they had plenty of military experience. They were, in fact, some of the most effective fighters in all of Spain at that time. They had lots of supply. In fact, it's said that their, their development of supply lines was better than competing uh, state structures in the region uh, 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 previous to that. They had high levels of discipline. Their militias functioned very well. This person's just garn just a bunch of lies. Um, uh, so anyway, they go on and on and on. Just basically saying they should have cooperated. They should have sold out the revolution and cooperated with the liberal government. 
<clears throat> and uh, lying and saying the CNTFAI was not stateless uh, because they had coordination. They had some form of centralized coordination uh, and economic policies. So more even theoretic misunderstandings. Um, and then they'd basically say anybody who tries to blame the USSR is looking for scapegoats. Uh, I used to hate the USSR and think they destroyed my precious CNT FAI revolution, but then I learned more about it. No, it sounds like you didn't learn anything. <laughs> um, so this is a big reason why that I do videos like this, because people are unfortunately very easily able to be deceived when they don't have a good foundation. This person's a perfect example. And then, of course, they respond, where did you learn all this from? Which resources? Other person, citation needed? And uh, no, they never responded, of course. There's no citation for these things. Or if they are, it's all propaganda. The Bolsheviks made up a lot of lies about the CNT FAI while they were doing the things I described, while they were destroying them. Um, I didn't even get into the fact that there were literally um, shooting wars in the urban centers as the, the uh, uh, Soviet-aligned uh, m militias and military structures um, openly tried to destroy the CNT FAI. Um, you know, there were, there were casualties in these, in these uh, conflicts. So uh, during that time, they were also spreading propaganda in all the urban centers, uh, saying that the, the uh, anarchists were fascists and that they were fascist collaborators uh, with absolutely no evidence. It was just fully made up uh, propaganda that was spread everywhere. And it sounds like this person's just regurgitating a bunch of Bolshevik propaganda from the time of the Spanish Civil War. And everybody asked for citations and they didn't give any. And the reason is probably because if they did, they would just give citations from a bunch of Bolshevik propagandists. So there's your cautionary tale for the video. <laughs> oh, yeah, this one, this one, uh, they say, really enjoyed the video, though, though there's an extremely high pitched noise in the background from timestamp to timestamp. It's not really a problem, just kind of odd and annoying. Um, I'm old. Uh, maybe I can't hear it. It's funny because I, I think I even say that in the comments. I'm like, how old are you? Because I'm 36 and I can't hear it. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but your your hearing degrades over the course of your life. You can't hear higher, like your ability to hear high pitches goes down, down, down. So the younger you are, the higher pitches you can hear. Um, and the person then goes on to say they're 16. So maybe that's why they can hear it. So that's all the comments that I picked out for this video. Um, that was part three of The State is Counter-Revolutionary. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, I actually enjoy doing these videos. Uh, I actually like the Anarch Responds videos. They're relatively low effort, but I get to kind of talk about things that are interesting to me. I get to rehash some of the topics of the videos. Um, I know I said that I was going to do an Anarch Abridged this week and that I was going to alternate, but I think I'm just kind of play it by ear. Uh, these these Anarch Responds videos have actually been doing uh, pretty well in the algorithm. So I think I'm going to keep doing them here for a little while. Y'all have given me good feedback. You tell me that you seem to like these videos. Uh, and for me, you know, I actually, I think I get a little more enjoyment out of making them. I'll probably reserve the Anarch abridged videos for when there's some particular topic I would actually really like to talk about. And one that just kind of like comes to mind and really grabs my interest. Um, or alternatively, I suppose, as soon as I run out of video essays or, uh, of, of previous videos to do Anarch response videos to, uh, to then, uh, yeah, obviously I, I might start doing doing more Anarch abridged videos. But anyway, if you like the video, go click like. Um, if you have been getting recommended these videos time after time, and they keep popping up in your feed and you keep clicking them and watching them, and here you are now at the end of like a, an hour and 10 minute video, and you're listening to me say this right now, you should just click subscribe because this is the content I produce on this channel. You know, the only difference is it's just going to come up on your subscription feed instead. So, you know, go click subscribe. If you like this video, if you have any commentary, if you have any thoughts, if any of the things that I just said have, have inspired your mind and, and made you think of something that you would like to discuss with people in the comments, go leave a comment. Also, if you support the project I'm doing here, 
if you think what I'm doing has value, has worth, if you want to see this YouTube channel succeed and expand, and for me to be able to do these videos, you know, with, with more production value, if you want to see me do live streams more regularly, if you want to see those video essays come out a little faster, you should go become a patron on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash anarch, A-N-A-R-K. Obviously, that's going to be down in the description. But I think that does it for today's video. Um, that's the end of my spiel. I won't put you through any more. I'll see you next time.